Chapter 961, A Room Full of Gold Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations A book holds a house of gold. Qin Yeming had heard of this remark at least three times when he was staying with Pang Jing. After some careful thinking, he believed that this was what the governor of the western regions was trying to convey to the Dragon King. This sentence, which had originally been meant as sarcasm, had now become a clue. A book? Does it mean a study? Mo Lin was the first one to think of a possible location where the gold could be stored. It's worth a visit. There were two studies in the mansion, one in front and the other in the rear. It was still late at night. Twelve sabersmen from the Norland were in the backyard, protecting Mo Chu. So, the courtyard appeared empty and there was a faint air of eeriness about it. Qin Yeming followed the Dragon King closely, feeling both ashamed of his cowardliness and relieved that the Dragon King was present. The study in the front of the mansion was very clean. There were not many books in it, and most of them were documents that had been left behind by former governors. Qin Yeming quickly lit the oil lamp on the table to light the room for the Dragon King. Everything in the room was apparent to the eye. Nothing could stay hidden within this room. Ji Yushan Wei lowered his head and moved his eyes to the ground. Qin Yeming carried the oil lamp and stamped all around. After a full circle, all three people confirmed that there was no secret space hidden underground. Do you have something to say? asked Ji Yushan Wei. Though the teenager was serving the Dragon King wholeheartedly, there was still confusion gleaming in his eyes. Qin Yeming immediately knelt down. He was still uncertain about his identity, so he didn't know what he should say and what he shouldn't say. I'm a servant of the Dragon King, and I should have served Dragon King with undivided loyalty, but uncertainty rose within me. I beg the Dragon King for his pardon. If you want to be my servant, then you'll have to stand up before talking. Qin Yeming hurriedly rose to his feet, his head still down. You also have to be honest, which is one of your duties. Qin Yeming briefly blushed. Yes. I wonder. I wonder if Pan Jing would send his men here to assassinate the governor. Once the governor is dead, then he'll be able to come back here rightfully. This is a game, and Pan Jing was the one who made the rules. I think that he'll abide by it. Ji Yushan Wei walked towards the doorway, not worried about Mo Chu's safety at all. After arriving at the courtyard, he looked at the roof of the east wing and added, even if he doesn't want to abide by it, someone will force him to. A crisp sound came from the dark. It sounded like the snapping of a twig. It suddenly dawned on Qin Yeming that though the security inside this mansion seemed loose, there were actually many kung fu experts on the periphery guarding it. Then the three went to the inner study near the backyard, which was not far from Mo Chu's bedroom. He hadn't gone to bed yet, and he didn't dare. After glimpsing the Dragon King through the crack in the door, he hurriedly ran out of his room and knelt down in a very natural manner. His face was full of fear as he said, Dragon King, I'm honored to have this chance to serve you again, but I'm too old. My eyesight is poor and my mind is also not as clear as it used to be. I'm really worried that I might ruin the Dragon King's overall plan. Mo Chu was uncertain about his status, so he was trying to ask the Dragon King what his intentions were in a roundabout way. Ji Yushan Wei said to him, do what a governor is supposed to do for the next three months. After that, I'll send you to the grasslands where you'll settle down next to the new Khan. Greatly relieved, Mochu kowtowed and expressed his gratitude. He knew how to be a good governor, not make a single remark that he shouldn't make, and not ask a single question that he shouldn't ask. Qin Yeming noticed that the governor had been kneeling while talking, and the Dragon King had accepted this in a natural manner without any intention of letting him rise at all. He started to realize that the Dragon King treated the people who he trusted and those he didn't trust differently and with that, he became more certain about what he should do. Mo Lin was also observing this interaction, which was an old habit that he had developed when he had been serving the old Khan. 
In his mind, the Dragon King was still too young, and his methods were fairly immature, but better than most princes. His ways of punishing and rewarding subordinates bore a faint similarity to that of the old Khan, but the differences between them were more striking. The Dragon King had a very suspicious and cautious mind. Though this teenager was merely an insignificant servant, he had still put a lot of effort and taken him seriously. The old Khan would have handled Golden Rock Castle had had plenty of time. Mochu had left for Heaven's Pass to be the commander-in-chief of the Norlands armies more than a year ago. After that, he had been put under house arrest, and the governor's mansion had been lying idle since then. All the men guarding the mansion were from Golden Rock Castle, so they could leisurely thicken the walls with as few people knowing about it as possible. The Unique King Why didn't he transfer the gold to Golden Rock Castle? Qin Yeming risked asking a question. Because he had no intention of keeping this money from the very beginning, said Ji Yushan Wei. He and Meng Mingxu had actually done the unique king a great favor by collectively faking that robbery, but the dragon army had also profited from it. The Meng family was the only side that suffered losses. If Prince Luo Luo wins, then the mansion would be his. If the people of the Central Plains come, then the unique king will send the money to them as well. He. So the unique king has been colluding with Pan Jing for quite some time. Mo Lin had never been a talkative person, but he was from the Norland, so he was more than willing to see the dragon king rupture his relation with the central plains. Mo Lin's guess was right. Perhaps waiting for Pan Jing's arrival was exactly the reason why the unique king had been making concessions all along. Conceal the cut in the wall, Ji Yushan Wei ordered. Qin Yeming asked in amazement, leave the gold here. Pan Jing is surely trying to figure out a way to take this mansion back. And Golden Rock Castle also won't give up these gold ingots for no good reason, right? There's no hurry, said Ji Yushan Wei, giving no further explanation. Qin Yeming observantly shut up, picked up the wallpaper from the ground, carefully put it back to its original position, and then pushed the bookshelf over it to cover it. Nobody would notice it without paying close attention to that wall. Mo Lin said, your secret is safe with me. Though it was just a simple promise, Mo Lin believed that it was enough. If the person he was talking to was the old Khan, then he wouldn't have even bothered making this promise. Ji Yushan Wei respected Mo Lin's promise, so he left the mansion with Qin Yeming without saying another word. The two people returned to the Department of Guards in Southern Jade City at daybreak. On their way back, after pondering over it for a long time, Qin Yeming believed there was only one way to gain the Dragon King's trust. So, he quickly made a bed for the Dragon King, took a few steps back, bowed deeply and said, Please allow me to cut off my tongue, Dragon King so that I won't be able to divulge the secret. Faintly amused, Ji Yushan Wei looked at the teenager and said, there are many ways to divulge a secret. Talking is only one of them. Qin Yeming was briefly stunned and then seriously said, I understand. I won't let myself concern the Dragon King. After saying this, he meant to take his leave. Committing suicide won't help either. I sent you to Pan Jing, so you're no longer a nobody. Your death itself would be an important message. Qin Yeming was transfixed with amazement. He had never expected that things would be so complicated. All the plans that he had thought of were now useless. Dragon King, I. I. Actually, you don't have any secrets to divulge. Both Pan Jing and I know exactly what is going on. If someone tries to bribe you, then I suggest that you take as much money as you can get and then tell them the truth. Qin Yeming's eyes were wide with shock. I'm expecting Prime Minister Xiong Hung to come by. Wake me when he arrives. Yes, Qin Yeming answered before walking out of the room and gently closing the door, trying hard to figure out what the Dragon King meant. At last, he drew the conclusion that he should never try to speculate on the Dragon King's true thoughts. 
all he needed to do was follow his orders. This was the wisest decision that Qin Yeming had ever made in his life. As expected, Zhang Heng came very early, having even more questions than Qin Yeming had, but the Dragon King didn't grant him permission to get involved in the Meng family's issue. Thus, he tried not to ask any questions about it. Preparations for the Kung Fu competition are almost done. Only the venue and date remain undecided. It has to be a place that all sides deem safe. I have a suggestion. You can propose it at today's meeting. Golden Rock Castle will probably agree. I'm all ears, Dragon King. The Governor's Mansion. That's in Northern Jade City, which is Golden Rock Castle's territory. Is this the reason why the Dragon King brought Mochu back? It is. Apart from this, I'll also station more people in Northern Jade City. This is a collateral condition and Golden Rock Castle must accept it. Otherwise, we'll pick another venue for the Kung Fu competition. Zhang Heng smiled. He didn't know the truth, but he knew that the negotiate. Chapter 962, A Traitorous Thought Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations Lu Qiying had fabricated many excuses to defend himself with, but upon seeing the Dragon King, he didn't dare state any of them. Once again, he felt the anguish that he had suffered when he lost his finger many years ago, and it was even more intense this time. Back then, the Dragon King had merely been a killer of Golden Rock Castle, someone who had just killed his mentor and become an independent killer. He had come to Tavern Keeper Lu's house to claim Tai Han Feng's savings. The moment a minor disagreement arose, he had whipped out his saber and cut off one of Tavern Keeper Lu's fingers. Because of this memory, Lu Qiying had given up all thought of kneeling down to plead for his life. He remained sitting on the chair, and he put on a stiff expression to dissemble the fear inside of him. By comparison, Xiao Feng Chai was the real composed one as she had been sipping at her tea quietly from the very beginning. Occasionally, she would even stretch out her hands to tidy her headwear and clothes. This cheap woman is still trying to seduce me, Lu Qiying thought angrily. Pointing at Xiao Feng Chai, who was sitting on the opposite side of the table, he loudly said, it was her. This was all her idea. Dragon King, I. I was fooled. Xiao Feng Chai smiled, it was indeed my plan. I plotted the whole thing. Lu Qiying was merely a minion. Just kill me, Dragon King. Lu Qiying was stunned. He had never expected that Xiao Feng Chai would plead for him, and he actually was somewhat touched. The day before, wasn't he still dreaming of living with this woman in the Lu Lan Kingdom? He sighed but didn't say anything. His gratitude to her was overpowered by fear. He had no intention of claiming responsibility. Ji Yushun Wei also gently sighed. Lu Qiying was still not as smart as Xia Feng Chai. An attempt to shift the blame was unhelpful in mollifying the penalty. Instead, it was synonymous with giving the right to negotiate to her. Ji Yushun Wei had no choice but to talk directly to Xia Feng Chai. Both of these two people had been personally chosen by he himself. But now, they had both betrayed him. He couldn't just idly stand by. We need to talk. Xiao Feng Chai looked back at the Dragon King and fixed her eyes on his. In a life or death moment, she wouldn't count on anybody else to save her. Money. It was all because of money. I will only serve the one who has the Meng family's money. I'm sorry, but I think that the Dragon King understand this. Um. I do, replied Ji Yushun Wei. He had to admit that socializing with people like Xiao Feng Chai made things easier. Lu Qiying widened his mouth and then looked at him in amazement. He felt confused about the Dragon King's mild attitude. After having lived in Jade City for so many years, he was not at all stupid. It was just that fear had clouded his judgment. When he recollected himself, 
he immediately realized Xiao Feng Chai's intention as well as his miscalculation. That's true. The Dragon King lied to us. No, no. I mean, we helped the Dragon King purchase a lot of things on credit. Ah, uh, the Dragon King got the Meng family's money back, right? Naturally, we'll continue to serve the Dragon King. The more Lu Qiying talked, the more unsure he became. Xiao Feng Chai took advantage of this opportunity and drew the Dragon King's attention back to her. No matter where the Meng family's money is, everybody in the city is saying that the Dragon King is broke. I'm afraid that soon, creditors will all throng to your house all at once and that even the gate will be broken. They've already come. Ji Yu Wei didn't try to conceal the difficult situation that he was facing. But fortunately, the gate will stay intact. Lu Qian gave an unnatural smile and took the Dragon King's joke as a gesture of goodwill, but Xiao Feng Chai withdrew her smile. I can solve your financial problem. You can? I have some money of my own. Not much, but it should be enough to repay part of the debt, which will comfort the other creditors. As for the rest of the debt, I have a plan. The Meng family has declined, but someone has to take over the businesses in the western regions. The Dragon King already has half of the western regions under your control. So, you can just franchise all of the industries in different areas. I can guarantee that all the merchants in the western regions will be willing to pay a very high price to obtain this right. Not only will the Dragon King be able to repay all the debt, but he will also make some money on the side. It was not until this moment that light dawned on Lu Qiying. What was the point of confessing and begging for mercy? Proving his value was the only way to survive. I'll donate my money as well. I'll donate all of it. And I can contact merchants in different areas of the western regions and establish a trading company even larger than that of the Meng family. I want all of the merchants in Jade City, no all of the merchants in the entire western regions to have faith in the dragon army in three days, so that nobody will ever mention my debt ever again. Three days was a very short time. Most of the areas in the western regions wouldn't even be able to hear the rumor. But Xiao Feng Chai understood that once she handled the merchants in Jade City, then those in other areas would no longer be a problem. Again, Lu Qiying accepted the offer before she did. No problem. Three days. All I need is three days. If any creditor comes here again, I'll repay the debt with my head. The reason why I'm sparing you is not because you're useful. There are other people who can handle the debt problem for me. Yes, yes. Lu Qiying was uneasy. He knew that this wasn't over yet. Having said all she should, Xiao Feng Chai listened quietly. It is because news of your betrayal didn't spread very far. Lu Qiying was relieved. It turned out that the Dragon King didn't want outsiders to laugh at him. But there is one person who has betrayed me in public, and almost everybody knows it. I have to eliminate him. Lu Qiying's heart lurched. He thought for a moment that the Dragon King was referring to him, and he nearly fell off the chair but his stupidity was not incurable. So he soon realized who the person the Dragon King had mentioned was. Meng Mingxu. Meng Mingxu publicly framed the Dragon King. By no means will he be able to get away with it. Lu Qiying had forgotten that it was because of him that the new patriarch of the Meng family had chosen to betray the Dragon King. Xiao Feng Chai remained silent. She was merely a merchant, and the Dragon King was the killer, but now they had reversed their roles. She was wondering whether the Dragon King was testing her or making her the instrument of murder. The Dragon King has the Meng family's money, right? It's so right that I no longer need the people of the Meng family, Ji Yu Shenwei said. Xiao Feng Chai and Lu Qiying then returned to Northern Jade City. Xu Xiao walked into the room and shook his head his face full of disbelief as he stroked his mustache. The Dragon King just spared them like that. Lu Qiying is a fool. 
Xiao Feng Chai. To be honest, Dragon King, she's too cunning and also too seductive. Sooner or later, she will cause you trouble again. Killing people is usually the simplest move. Stunned, Xu Xiaoyi didn't understand the meaning of this inexplicable remark of the Dragon King's. That's true. If someone is tied up and brought in front of me, then even I can take a saber and kill them. All I have to do is stab them. Um. How to tie the target and bring them in front of you is usually the most difficult part. Xu Xiaoyi partially understood and his eyes lit up. So it turns out that the Dragon King will still punish them. Now I feel much better. One of them was a whore, and the other was a tavern keeper. If it weren't for the fact that the Dragon King promoted them, they would probably still be in Southern Jade City. However, they chose to become traitors the moment they got some power. The very thought makes me angry. As he observed this intelligence executive that had been serving him for the longest time, Ji Yu Shenwei suddenly asked, the Dragon Army still needs a financial executive. Do you have any recommendations? Xu Xiaoyi immediately blurted out, how about me? But soon, he blushed scarlet. Alas, forget about it. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to resist the temptation when there's too much money in front of me. Your current position is very important. I can't find someone else to replace you. Ji Yu Shenwei made this remark to remind Xu Xiaoyi to stop thinking about money. The Dragon King values me too much, Xu Xiaoyi said gloomily. He was disillusioned. But it was still a good thing to have the Dragon King's trust. Let me think. Managing money. I have a recommendation, but I'm afraid that the Dragon King might not agree. Try me. Actually, I think that Queen Ju is a suitable candidate. She might be a little young and not as experienced as Xia Feng Chai, but she will never betray Dragon King. If the money is in her hands, then the Dragon King can rest assured. Ji Yu Shenwei immediately realized what Xu Xiaoyi was thinking of. His elder sister was the most important handmaid of Queen Ju's, which meant that Queen Ju being in charge of money was naturally synonymous with Xu Yang Wei being in charge of money. How much do you know about her? Xu Xiaoyi briefly blushed red again and decided to be honest. The Dragon King can ask my elder sister about it. She always speaks highly of Queen Ju. You can also ask the counselor or the prime minister. They will share my opinion. Fang Wencher and Xiong Heng did have a very good opinion of Queen Ju, but Ji Yu Shenwei barely remembered what she looked like. I'll think about it. Ji Yu Shenwei stayed alone for a while after that. Xiao Feng Chai's Chapter 963 Poison Translator, Hen Yi Translations Editor Hen Yi Translations. Looking over his social network, Meng Mingxu found that he had lost all of his friends. Everyone had betrayed him, and he had betrayed everybody. Like a half starved stray dog, he lay prostrate before the first one who beckoned to him, even if this man had just teased him, and even if there was an evil intent hiding behind his smile. Pang Jing, who was from the Central Plains, was the initiator of the conspiracy. Meng Mingxu was eager to grab his collar and question him. There's no animosity between us. Why did you frame me? But he didn't dare. When news came that Mo Chu had returned to the city and taken over the governor's mansion, he had found a spark of inspiration and publicly invited his foe over to live with him. When Pang Jing agreed, he even had to obsequiously express his gratitude. The central plains was so powerful that it was like the heavenly mountain in the north. No matter how many evil deeds it perpetrated, nobody was able to retaliate against it. Meng Mingxu didn't dare retaliate against Pang Jing, and he also didn't have the heart to punish himself, so he instead shifted all of his anger onto Xia Feng Chai. The more he thought about it, the more justifiable he found it. Pang Jing was the one who had originally formulated the plan, and Lu Qiying was the one who had originally came to him to persuade him. 
But the ultimate reason why he had fallen for it was because he trusted Xiaofeng Chai. He loved that woman, and the money that he had spent on her during all these years was enough to convince a princess of a small country to marry him. However, she had repaid his love with exploitation and betrayal. Shameless. Meng Mingxu quivered from head to toe with indignation. He put down the letter and said to the visitor, Okay. Tell your master that I'll be there on time. Lu Qiying had written him a letter, politely inviting him to a consultation. He implied that there would be another participant. Naturally, that person would be Xia Feng Chai. Meng Mingxu had just suffered a heavy loss, so he had regained a part of his senses. He took the letter to Pang Jing and asked him for advice. Meanwhile, he beat around the bush during the conversation, trying to figure out the relationship between this Central Plains man and Xiaofeng Chai. Pang Jing let out two laughs. Currently, his focus was not on these insignificant people, so he answered casually. She works for the Dragon King. I have nothing to do with any of her businesses. Meng Mingxu regarded this remark as a tacit permission. That night, he went to Retention Alley to rendezvous, only bringing two attendants with him. Surprisingly, after he made up his mind, he didn't feel afraid at all when he entered the jurisdiction of the Department of Guards. Butterfly counted as a famous prostitute in Retention Alley. In her prime, she had a naive and natural appearance when acting cute before hallmasters, which was why she had had a very high success rate in seducing them. Second young master Meng was one of her regulars. When he came to her place, Butterfly was both delighted and annoyed. Pulling at his sleeve, she first put on an air of anger and pinched him repeatedly, but she barely used any force. Though she kept saying, get out of here, her grip on him was very tight. Meng Mingxu was surprised to see how much Butterfly had changed. Last year, she had still been slightly inexperienced, spoiled, and cute, the longer she had affectionately tried to resist him, the more sexually excited he had become. But now, she began to show her greedy, hateful side. Her skills remained the same. Actually, she was even more skillful now. It was just her appearance that had changed. Butterfly was maturing quickly, and if she didn't change her style soon, then it was very likely that she wouldn't be able to stay in retention alley any longer. Most women's beauty is as transient as that of a flower. It blossoms, lasts a short time, and then fades away. Meng Mingxu sighed secretly and then immediately recalled Xiaofeng Chai. This woman was the only one whose beauty had endured the test of time, truly a miracle. The thought caused Meng Mingxu sharp pain. He blandly pushed Butterfly aside. Where's Lu Qiying? Has he arrived yet? Lu Qiying's voice came from upstairs. Oh. Second young master Meng has arrived. Please come up here. In Butterfly's room, the air was filled with a suffocating cloying fragrance, and there was a huge fire blazing in the fireplace. A table full of food had been prepared beforehand, along with wine. Casually sitting in the host's seat, Lu Qiying smiled. Second young master Meng, let's have a few goblets of wine first. And then, you can tell me how you're going to thank me. Thank you? Meng Mingxu sneered. What don't you tell me on whose behalf you're talking for this time? That Central Plains guy? The Dragon King? Golden Rock Castle. The moment the name Feng Chai formed on Lu Qiying's lips, rage surged inside Meng Mingxu, who then smacked his fists onto the surface of the table. You think that you're eligible to call her by her first name? Lu Qiying raised his palm that had only four fingers left, seemingly appreciating its ugly aesthetic. Not only my mouth, but even this hand of mine is worthy of her. She's just a prostitute, second young master Meng. Meng Mingxu instantly transferred his anger from Xiao Feng Chai onto Lu Qiying. He walked half a circle around the room, planning to teach this old guy a lesson. As he watched Meng Mingxu walk towards him, Lu Qiying said, 
There are hundreds of thousands of people who have slept with Xiaofeng Chai. Do you think that you can kill all of them? Meng Mingxu had clenched his fists, but he didn't launch an attack. Instead, he murmured, a bitch is a bitch after all. She's heartless, ungrateful, and cares for nothing but money. Lu Qiying shared his opinion, empathetically sighing, but men never learn. They race to jump into the trap and won't realize how stupid they are until they're covered in cuts and bruises. Meng Mingxu watched Lu Qiying in confusion. He never expected that this old man in his fifties or sixties would have also suffered the same pain that he had. You also? Yes, said Lu Qiying, his face no less indignant than Meng Mingxu's. I was fooled by a bitch. I labored and worked for her, but eventually, when I was trying to escape, she betrayed me. Meng Mingxu sat down dejectedly, the look on his face alternating between anger and dejection. Yes. We were all fooled. Xiao Feng Chai is the cause of all this. Why didn't that Central Plains guy take her away? Meng Mingxu had been asking himself this question all along, but didn't dare directly ask Pang Jing. Why? Because that Central Plains guy likes men. Meng Mingxu raised his head in amazement, thinking that Lu Qiying must be joking. Suddenly, his eyes lit up. Are you saying that? I should have noticed this earlier. This kind of person is not rare in Jade City either. I'm so stupid. So, Xiao Feng Chai was fooled as well. She was, but she deserves it. Ha ha. She deserves it. Meng Mingxu let out two loud laughs and with that, his face darkened. Why exactly did you invite me here? To take revenge. Take revenge. Lu Qiying fished out a small packet from his front pocket and held it in his palm. This poison is from the waning moon hall. It takes effect three hours after ingestion. Originally, I was planning on putting this in your goblet, but I'm more willing to see it take effect on Xiaofeng Chai. This was indeed a trap. Thinking about the heartlessness of Xiaofeng Chai, Meng Mingxu became furious, but he managed to control himself. Do you think that you can survive after killing Xiaofeng Chai? The Dragon King is not going to spare you again. You said it yourself. The Dragon King won't let me get away anyways. There's no doubt that he will kill me after the situation stabilizes. So, I came to you to seek shelter. I can't even protect myself. How am I supposed to shelter you? Jade City is not safe. Even if someone else obtains the position of Lord of Jade City, the Dragon King will still be able to kill us. We can only flee to the Central Plains, where the Dragon King won't be able to find us. You still have half of the Meng family's money. The Central Plains will surely welcome you. Half of the Meng family's money. Meng Mingxu seldom thought about the things in the vault of the old mansion. He was uncertain about who those gold ingots belonged to exactly. When will she come? Soon. Meng Mingxu snatched the pack of poison away. Why not use a poison that takes effect instantly? Xiao Feng Chai wanted you to die on Butterfly's bed so as to shift the blame onto her. Meng Mingxu snorted. He deeply felt the authenticity of the saying, a woman's heart was the most wicked. Lu Qiying walked to the doorway and summoned Butterfly to clean the table and bring more food and wine, but Butterfly sourly refused. She claimed that she was not a handmaid and kept nagging them even as two handmaids quickly cleaned the table and then brought some dishes from outside. An hour later, Xiao Feng Chai arrived. She was wearing men's clothes and a cape and had only brought only one attendant with her. She was an old rival of Butterfly, but Butterfly failed to recognize her. Finding that more and more men were showing up at her place, Butterfly couldn't help but complain. It was not until Lu Qiying paid her more silver ingots that she finally shut up and quietly stayed downstairs. After taking off her cape, Xiao Feng Chai appeared delicate and attractive, though she was wearing men's clothes. 
Meng Mingxu's determination to kill her wavered for a time. After all, they were all pawns of other people who had no choice but to follow their orders. What's the point of committing cannibali? Chapter 964 Entering for the Competition Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations Everyone in the room was talking in whispers, lamenting Meng Mingxu's death. The last patriarch of the Meng family had committed suicide by drinking poisoned wine after killing several people. Even the residents of Jade City, who had long ago gotten used to murder, were shocked by that scene. There were bodies both upstairs and downstairs. He stabbed each of the seven or eight victims several times. He himself was the only one whose body had no wounds. Was Meng Mingxu really that good? He was able to kill seven or eight people all by himself. Actually, most of the victims had already died after drinking poisoned wine. He just wanted to make sure that none of them would survive. TSK, TSK. I really didn't expect that Meng Mingxu. He had numerous gold ingots. He really left them behind just like that. Without even designating an heir? He. Numerous gold ingots. Don't mention them again. Meng Mingxu was either driven into a corner or hated Xiaofeng Chai's guts to the extreme. Otherwise, he would have never done this. Xiaofeng Chai. It's such a shame. I visited her three years ago. She was a pretty nice woman. It was just that she was too greedy. Her hunger for silver ingots could never be satiated. Fortunately I quit in time, or else. The topic of people's discussion diverged. Some of them continued pretending to mourn Meng Mingxu's death. Others started sharing their memories of the most famous prostitute of Retention Alley. It turned out that most of them had at one point spent a lot of money on her services. Immediately, they felt some kind of closeness to each other, as if they used to be classmates or from the same hometown. A receptionist monk standing at the doorway was silently reciting scriptures with his eyes closed, but occasionally, he would hear one or two sentences. Her skin was even more delicate than that of a teenage girl. I heard that she bathed in women's breast milk every day. I liked it the most when she whispered in my ear. Each one of her words was so considerate and tender that it made me as drunk as the best wine. The receptionist monk, who was in his twenties, had been sent to a temple when he was still a young boy. Though he couldn't quite understand the meaning of these remarks, he was still affected. His heart started fluttering, and he felt a surge of heat rise from the bottom of his feet and settle between his chest and his abdomen. I think that Meng Mingxu did a good deed before he died. That bitch got her just deserts, a woman in her early forties said loudly, staring at the crowd with a confrontational look on her face. As one of the few women in the room, she expressed her thoughts as the representative of more than half of all the prostitutes in Southern Jade City. The men just smiled, but none of them argued with her. This woman owned dozens of brothels of different sizes in Southern Jade City, and was in charge of nearly half of the human trafficking. She had never had a good opinion of Xiaofeng Chai. The receptionist monk quickly raised his head and shot a brief glance at that woman, and with that, waves of anger welled up inside of him. However, soon, his anger was replaced by self-repentance. When the head monk finally arrived with the honored guests, he hurriedly took his leave and started rushing into the temple. For the first time, he felt like these dignified buildings were restrictive. The head monk, F.A. Fong, was a little surprised by the receptionist monk's gaff, but he didn't have time to find out the reason behind it. With a mild smile like a merchant's on his face, he said, Please take your seats, benefactors. Governor Pang is going to explain matters concerning this kung fu competition through which the Lord of Jade City will be selected. With a childlike smile, Pang Jing strode to the host's seat in the innermost position of the room and stood there facing the crowd. There was no grief on his face at all, as if he hadn't even heard of Meng Mingxu's death. 
Everybody had heard that the other half of the Meng family's money had been taken by Pang Jing. So, the rumors said that Meng Mingxu's act of killing people was actually the Central Plains People's Conspiracy, but nobody could offer any specific details. Only a few smart ones had suspected that the gold ingots in the old mansion of the Meng family were actually counterfeits, and that Pang Jing had to take them all to cover up the truth. The public image of the official assigned here by the Central Plains was no longer a rash man who was too hasty. The leaders of the various organizations and protectors in Jade City became more respectful and also more vigilant of him. Pan Jing ignored this minor change in the people's attitude and said in an excited tone, the Kung Fu competition will be held in 15 days. For the first time in almost a hundred years, J. Everybody had heard of this rule before, but hardly any one of them wanted to participate. They didn't care whether they would be defeated or not. The key was they didn't want to offend the new lord of Jade City, as the entire Jade City believed that the new lord of Jade City would be either the unique king or the dragon king. The room was quiet for quite a while, and the atmosphere was somewhat awkward. Pang Jing let out a laugh. It seems that whoever becomes the lord will keep a low profile. Then I'll state my stance first, the Central Plains will not participate in this Kung Fu competition. The Lord of Jade City must be a native of the Western regions. This was also a message that everybody had known in advance, but there were still a lot of people who felt a wave of relief wash over them after they heard it from the governor of the Western regions himself. The waning moon hall will participate, said a voice from the corner. It was a young female who spoke. As if she had no idea how to appropriately communicate with people. She kept looking back at people directly with a cold and abrupt look, never avoiding anybody's eyes. She had been in this room for a long time but this was the first time that she had spoken. Pan Jing signaled the clerk beside him to start writing down names, and then smiled. Great. Finally, we have our first participant. But, you have to give the name of the person who wants to be the lord, and the one who will fight in the ring. Lord of Jade City, the Master Commander of the Waning Moon Hall, Lotus. Fighter, the Master Commander of the Waning Moon Hall, Lotus. The female said the names in a cold voice. Her answer was simple and direct. It sounded rather impolite, but she was setting an example which would be followed by all those who entered their names after her. Lord of Jade City, the unique king of Golden Rock Castle, Shangguan F.A. Fighter, the same person. A counselor in white entered the unique king's name on behalf of Golden Rock Castle. Everybody was quiet, paying due respect to this participant. Lord of Jade City, the king of the An Kingdom in Xiaoyao Lake, Tang Ping Sen, faint laughs were heard in the room. All of them were familiar with King An and nobody believed that he could be the Lord of Jade City. Fighter, swordsman Luo Chikung. All the laughs stopped instantly. This Central Plains swordsman had long established his reputation as a top-notch, ruthless swordsman in Jade City. Nobody dared to sneer at him. Meanwhile, everybody came to understood that the Central Plains wanted to interfere in this Kung Fu competition after all. Lord of Jade City, the sect leader of the Heavenly Mountain sect. Fighter, Sabersman Fang Shuyi. Some people were surprised that the Heavenly Mountain sect wanted to compete with their own master, the unique king, for the position of the Lord of Jade City. However, those beside them soon explained it to them. This is the unique king's vanguard. You don't think that the unique king will fight against some nobody, do you? Fang Shuyi was a strange name that nobody had heard of before, which was very normal. Everyone expected him to be a former killer of Golden Rock Castle, who probably had done numerous great things and killed numerous people, as a killer, he had just probably never made his name known to anybody. Naturally, the clerk had also never heard of this name before. He had to ask how the name was spelled before recording it down. Lord of Jade City, Shangguan Ayu from the Kuan Society. Fighter, Shangguan Ayu from the Kuan Society. 
This remark immediately caused animated discussion to spark. Shang Guan Ayu was the unique king's daughter, but she spent a lot of time with the Dragon King, and she had even become the queen of the Land of Fragrance. After returning to Jade City, she had taken in the killer disciples of Golden Rock Castle under the name of the Kuan Society. From the outsider's eyes, all the twists and turns of her life were incredible, and the people also felt that her stance was unpredictable. Upon seeing that the people had started discussing, Pang Jing smiled. This was what he had expected to see. It would be very boring if the Kung Fu competition was merely between the unique king and the dragon king. He! If there's going to be a fight between the Kuan Society and the Waning Moon Hall, then it will be very interesting. Someone suddenly thought of this, but he regretted saying it openly the moment he finished his last word. The female disciple of the Waning Moon Hall shot a cold glance at him. The faces of the representatives of the Kuan Society, Golden Rock Castle, and the Heavenly Mountain sect also darkened. The speaker hurriedly drew back and hid himself behind the crowd, no longer daring to say anything. Lord of Jade City, Chu Nanping from the Essence Pavilion. Fighter, Chu Nanping from the Essence Pavilion. The sixth participant's voice sent a ripple of amazement through the crowd. Chapter 965, Embrace. Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations. Panting for breath, those handmaids didn't know how many screens they had moved here, but their master was still discontent. With a frown on her face, Luo Ningcha peered at one of those screens. This one's not suitable. Who chose this one? Who do you think the guests will be looking at when they come? Me or the woman on this screen? The painting on the screen was of a beautiful woman on a spring outing. Afraid of being ordered to carry another screen, a handmaid, who had been serving the master for many years, ventured to say, all the women in the world are overshadowed in front of you, my lady, not to mention a painting dash. Luo Ningcha casually threw a teacup at the handmaid, and due to her many years of practice, the teacup hit her full in the forehead and smashed into pieces, the blood mixing with hot water and tea leaves as it flowed down. Please have mercy on me my lady. The handmaid hurriedly knelt down. She knew that she probably wouldn't be killed, but kneeling down was a standard procedure as well as the only way to appease her mistress. Luo Ningcha had already forgotten about the handmaid. Staring at the screen again, she said, um. Go and get another one immediately. It must be silken and translucent so that people on the other side can see my figure. However, the view they have can't be too clear. It has to be vague. And there mustn't be any women on the screen. Do you hear me? Luo Ningcha's tone became severe. The handmaids hastily answered, yes, carried the screen out of the tent, handed it to the Iron Mountain soldiers waiting outside, and then went to some nearby tents to pick out a suitable screen. Finally, the lady was satisfied with the new screen. There was only one defect, the screen was made of four segments. She was worried that too many frames might have an adverse effect on her beautiful figure, so she ordered a handmaid to stand behind the screen and walk step by step. Finally, she figured out which position was the best. Here it is. Do you have any idea how great a sacrifice I have to make because of you people? We'll never forget your great kindness, my lady, all handmaids said in unison out of force of habit, hoping that this farce would end as soon as possible. Sitting on a couch with her body slightly tilted, Luo Ningcha pictured her guests' possible reactions and felt that everything was perfect. Suddenly, she sighed, which startled the handmaids standing at her sides. Fortunately, the lady had just been carried away by her melancholy, and had no intention of changing any of the screams. Why did he only decide to see me after such a long time? Was it because the Iron Mountain and I are not famous enough? Or is it because some base guy stopped him from coming? The handmaid, whose forehead was wounded, was the mistress' favorite servant. Her companions kept signaling her, so she had no choice but to resignedly say, 
I guess dash. Who allowed you to speak? Luo Ningchao reprimanded and tried to grab something but failed to find anything suitable to throw, so she let it go. She contemplated her situation for a while, but her mind kept wandering. She clenched her teeth and uttered two words in a low voice. Ungrateful guy. Her handmaids hung their heads even lower. They all knew that this guy was the Dragon King. The lady blamed him every time she couldn't get her way. Luo Ningchao was not good at thinking, so she snappily said, Little Shin, if you want to say something, then say it. You holding your words back makes me uncomfortable. The handmaid named Little Shin had been serving Luo Ningcha for many years. She had become Luo Ningcha's handmaid when Luo Ningcha had still been a teenager. The names of her four handmaids, Chen, Shin, Ah Yu, and Yi had stayed unchanged, but the girls who bore these four names had been replaced again and again. Little Shin was the only one who had never been replaced. Throughout all these years, she had witnessed many of her fellow colleagues be killed or injured, and had developed an unperturbed and numb attitude, which was more than enough to handle her mistress' unpredictable and violent temper. I think, it is said that Governor Pang is Prince Xiao's friend. There are many rules and courtesies in the Central Plains. Governor Pang was probably too embarrassed to come here to meet you because of your relationship with Prince Xiao. Luo Ningcha felt that this explanation was very reasonable, so she involuntarily nodded along. Then why did he decide to meet me here today? And his coming here himself too. This was all Little Shin could think of with her limited intelligence. The more opinions the people around the lady expressed to her, the more of a punishment they received. So, she was unwilling to try to figure this out. Maybe. Maybe it is because you're too famous, so Governor Pang couldn't help himself from coming here. Nonsense. Every time he came to the Iron Mountain camp, his mother would always ask him this question at the beginning of their conversation. Shang Guan Cheng climbed onto the couch with the help of a handmaid, pouted, and said, I miss you. I also miss the stone castle. Shang Guan Cheng had evaded his mother's question. It was his childish opinion that the Dragon King was still an enemy. Besides, they seldom met. But every time he showed hatred towards the Dragon King, his mother would become angry, so he had already learned how to dissimulate his thoughts. Soon, Luo Ningcha said excitedly, regarding her young son as an adult. When the Kung Fu competition is over, we'll go back to the stone castle. That's your home. You'll be in charge of everything, but you'll have to follow my orders. Things like being in charge of everything didn't interest Shang Guan Cheng. He was more concerned with the Kung Fu competition. Father is invincible. He will surely defeat all my enemies and take me back. Sure. Um? Which father were you talking about? Kneeling on the couch, Shang Guan Cheng watched his mother, eyes wide with confusion. He could vaguely feel that his mother's question was terrifying. Luo Ningcha laughed. You little moron. Why do I feel that you kind of look like Shang Guan and you? That's impossible. Never mind. Anyways, I'm telling you, the unique king is not invincible. There are a lot of other people who are better than him. And it will not be him but the dragon king who's going to send you back to the stone castle. Understand. That's not true. The unique king is the toughest. Shang Guan Cheng stood up and was even taller than his mother who was sitting. Due to his momentary excitement, he had also called his father the unique king. He'll kill a lot of people. The dragon king is no match for father even if he has the giant rock. Luo Ningcha felt that her mood for playing with her son was gone. What do you know about it? is not necessarily your. Luo Ningcha shut up in time. Nobody could secure themselves against all risks and dangers. Currently, the Dragon King was at an advantage, but who knew whether the balance of power would change or not in the future. It did her no harm to have an extra backup plan. 
Luo Ningcha believed that she was very smart. Okay, okay. Play here for a while and then leave. Mother has something to deal with today. You can't stay here. What is it? Do you want me to help? Shang Guan Cheng asked happily. Still young, he always blurted out whatever was on his mind. He pounced on his mother, planning to jump into her arms. Luo Ningcha's face went pale. As if a dirty dog or cat was trying to pounce on her, she yelled in horror, Don't touch me. I just changed my clothes. They stain very easily. Arms open, Shang Guan Cheng slightly blushed in awkwardness. This was her natural son after all. Luo Ningcha did feel that his look was a little painful to watch. Little Shin, come here and hug Chenga. Chenga, don't look at her face. She's just like mother. Shang Guan Cheng enjoyed the embrace of a substitute mother, and with that, he was sent out of the tent. Too young to experience depression, he just felt a little upset. Then he saw Han Fen in the distance. Surprisingly, he felt that this bizarre woman seemed very cordial. Han Fen was wrestling with a soldier of the Iron Mountain Army. The soldiers who were looking on watched with fixed eyes and yelled all at once, You lost. Get out. Next. Han Fen, who had won again, said with a big smile, Do you know how to wrestle? You should hold your opponent's waist. Why were you aiming at my chest? Besides, your body was too limp. I was so close. The soldier was even more disappointed than Shang Guan Cheng. The touch that he wanted so much had slipped away at the last moment. Upon seeing a Han maid carry Shang Guan Cheng in the distance, Han Fen ignored those soldiers trying to persuade her to stay, elbowed her way through the crowd, and took Shang Guan Cheng into her arms. Kid, you came out so soon today. Um. Shang Guan Cheng leaned tightly against Han Fen, finding that this was the most comfortable embrace. Han Fen mounted her horse, put Shang Guan Cheng before her, rode out of the camp, and headed for the Dragon Army's camp under the escort of dozens of guards. Along the way, Shang Guan Cheng remained silent. He just leaned against Han Fen's chest and let the horse toss him up and down as he listened to the weird tune that the eccentric woman was humming. Han Fen, Shang Guan Cheng called out in a low voice. He had once tried other forms of address, but the bizarre woman either ignored him or directly refused to be called by other names, as her name was purely Han Fen. What's wrong, kid? Han Fen stopped humming. All of the soldiers around her were relieved. When other women sang songs about hearts or something like that, they usually blushed and their hearts fluttered. But when Han Fen did it, they were horrified. Chapter 966, A Figure Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations General-in-Chief Nage was ashamed to tell others his title. In the past, people had called him Chief or his full name, which sounded casual and cordial, especially when he was drinking with his brethren. But because of an order from Luo Ningcha, he had to promote himself from the Chief of the Iron Mountain Army to the General-in-Chief of the Iron Mountain Army which was a position several ranks higher. Every time there was a visitor, Luo Ningcha would always claim in a complacent tone, the Central Plains has a general-in-chief. Well, so does the Iron Mountain. Look at him. Isn't he mighty and awe-inspiring? On an occasion like this, Nage had to take a couple of steps in front of the visitor with his head up and his chest thrown out. He seemed like a peacock that had been summoned by its mate as he displayed his dramatic, gilded armor that had an unduly long feather that hindered him from entering and exiting tents. His brethren joked about this, but they themselves also had titles like general, captain, or something like that. So it was just the pot calling the kettle black. What scared Nage the most was when he had to receive visitors from the central plains, who would always burst into laughter and refrain from commenting. However, this kind of response only made his face blush even more. Pan Jing, the governor of the western regions, was an exception. 
The moment he entered the military camp and saw Nage walking towards him head on, he paused and let out a cheer. What a mighty general in chief of the Iron Mountain Army. Don't get too close to me. You make me ashamed of my unseemliness. Nage was in his late forties. His most striking feature was his tall physique, which had not been very obvious when the big head god had been still alive. But now, he stood out like a crane in a flock of fowls wherever he went. In fact, he had been appointed as vice leader by the big head god and Luo Ningcha successively, and one of the most important reasons for which was his height, and it was relatively more so in Luo Ningcha's case. As tall as he was, Nage had a mild face. His eyes were always curved, which was getting more obvious as he grew older, making it seem like he was always smiling. He was indeed a pushover. During robberies, he always allowed the victims to keep some money so that they could get home. Sometimes, he would even sincerely remind them, don't take this road again. It's not safe. Taking a detour would be a better choice. After all, getting home safe is the most important thing. If someone tried to resist, then he would kill them quickly and cleanly as a matter of principle. He wouldn't taunt nor torture them. Nage's biggest hobby was drinking and roughhousing with his brethren and making fun of each other, regardless of their rank. As a result, he immediately had a favorable impression of Pang Jing. It wasn't just because of this central plainsman's compliments, though, but rather because of his casual, informal manner. It made him feel like this man was the kind of man that he could be friends with. He had met the Dragon King before and he had felt uneasy during every one of his meetings with the Dragon King. After every meeting, he would always feel like it was very lucky of him to have not joined the Dragon Army. He couldn't bear to stand primly besides a master whose face was always cold. He had heard that the Dragon King barely drank, which was even more unbearable for him. Nage burst into laughter, the upright feather on his helmet tilting back. That's not true. You must be teasing me secretly. Pan Jing walked over, stood beside Nage, raised his head, put his right hand to his eyebrow, and said in a dramatic tone, My joke has to be as light as a feather to be able to waft into your ears. TSK, TSK, General in Chief, do your brethren know what you look like? Nage laughed even more delightedly. As tall as he was, people didn't need to raise their heads to see his face but he liked this kind of joke. He gave Pang Jing a casual slap on the shoulder and found that this official from the Central Plains had a very steady footing, so he held up his thumb and paid him a compliment. Do you practice Kung Fu? Good for you. Affected by their conversation, the soldiers of the Iron Mountain all relaxed and cordially greeted Pang Jing's attendants. The orderly ranks instantly revealed their true colors. Nage had to open his arms and urge his guest to enter the main tent. Upon hearing the commotion outside, Luo Ningcha was confused. When the general in chief and the visitor walked inside with their arms around each other's shoulders like two drunken drinking buddies, she became even unhappier, but she still wanted to give Pan Jing a good impression of herself. So, she straightened her clothes, sat properly with her upper body slightly tilting to one side but refrained from speaking Imedi. General is flattering me. I'm sure that I don't deserve that compliment. Besides, you haven't even seen me yet. Luo Ningcha's tone didn't change much, but her not being angry was synonymous with encouragement. Pang Jing cupped his hands before his chest and bowed deeply. The fragrance of famous flowers is impressive, and it leaves traces wherever it wafts. How could a mere scream conceal Madam's beauty? I have to beg Madam's pardon again. I wish that the scream could be removed so that I can get a glimpse of your face. This is all I ask. You don't sound like Prince Xiao's friend, General. Prince Xiao deliberately dared me on this. He ordered me to wait for at least a month before visiting Madam. I don't really need this kind of friend. Besides, his position in the Central Plains is at stake. What? Luo Ningcha exclaimed in shock. 
This time she didn't try to pretend, but her voice was still pleasant. Pan Jing hurriedly shot his hand to his mouth. Oh. What is wrong with me today? Don't worry about it, madam. That was me talking nonsense. Luo Ningcha let out a coffin with that, those handmaids took the hint and immediately left. They had sore waists and legs and really didn't want to move another screen door. Nage was a little hesitant. He felt unwanted but also didn't want his mistress to be alone with this Central Plains man during their first meeting. Luo Ningcha also seemed to have her own plans, saying, the general-in-chief will stay here. He's the core of the Iron Mountain Army as well as the man that I trust the most. Nage immediately threw out his chest, thinking, if only mistress always talked in this pleasant manner. Luo Ningcha rose from the couch, slowly walked out from behind the screen, but only revealed half of her body. Her eyes were looking down, like a small deer leaving its birthplace for the first time. Pan Jing stared fixedly at the most famous beauty in Jade City, his face as pale as that of the Dragon King, remaining silent for quite a while. Highly satisfied with his reaction, Luo Ningcha retreated behind the screen again and said, I'm only a weak woman who has inherited command of this Iron Mountain army. It's really been difficult for me to live in these troubled times. If General knows some inside information, then please tell me, lest I be blindsided by misfortune. Pan Jing clenched his teeth, as if making an extremely difficult choice. How can I say no to Madam? Actually, there's no need for Madam to worry too much about Prince Xiao. His Highness is an uncle of the incumbent emperor who trusts him very much. It's very likely that he will escape from the jaws of danger. It does no harm for me to take precautions. Besides, I also want to know if there's anything that I can do for Prince Xiao. Well. All right. Actually I'm not supposed to disclose this. General-in-chief, block your ears, Luo Ningcha ordered. Nage was stunned. He had just thought that the mistress was a sophisticated talker when she suddenly requested him to do such an embarrassing thing. He would rather leave the tent than block his ears and stand to the side like a servant. You misunderstood, madam. I can tell that General-in-Chief is a man of discretion at first sight. But Luo Ningcha had already made up her mind. She repeated, block your ears. Nage had no choice but to follow the order. There was no handkerchief or something like that on him, so he tore a strip of cloth off of his coat armor, halved it, and stuffed the two pieces into his ears. Then he let out two coughs and found that the cloth did partially block the transmission of sound, so he nodded. Now you can talk, General Pang. Luo Ningcha was too concerned to keep pretending, so her voice had returned to normal which was somewhat like the voice of a spoiled, imperious woman. It seemed as if Pan Jing didn't notice the change. The look on his face was faintly solemn. It was still because of the battle in Thousand Horsemen Pass. What about it? Rumor says that Prince Xiao submitted a fraudulent claim of military exploits, that the Central Plains army under his command actually suffered a crushing defeat and that it was the Dragon King who defeated the Norlanders and then gave all the credit to Prince Xiao. The defeat of the Central Plains army was a part of the plan formulated in advance by Prince Xiao and the Dragon King. There's no doubt about it. You're right, madam. But there are many rival factions with the Imperial Court of the Central Plains. Prince Xiao's enemies have been trying to find his flaws regardless of the cost to them. The Emperor trusts Prince Xiao very much. What does he have to worry about? The Dragon King is not necessarily going to keep this a secret forever. The Emperor's trust in Prince Xiao is the very reason why he will be extremely angry if he finds out that Prince Xiao submitted a fraudulent claim of military exploits. Ha ha. Nobody can make the. Chapter 967. Partition. Translator. Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations The intelligence reports sent over had doubled during the past few days, 
and almost all of them were related to the Kung Fu competition that would elect the Lord of Jade City. Zhong Hang, who had finished negotiating, was staying in the Dragon King's tent and helping him check and approve documents. They're worthless. Zhang Hang stared at the stack of papers three or four feet high on the table and rubbed his temples, wondering how he had managed to read them all. All of these messages are merely speculations. The Dragon King has really startled Jade City. In fact, Zhang Hang had heard the news merely six hours earlier than others did, so he was just as startled and had been hoping to be given an explanation. But the Dragon King had remained silent during the last few days and just asked him to read through the stacks of intelligence reports. What do the residents think of Long Fanyun? asked Ji Yushan Wei. They think highly of him. Zhang Hang knew that the Dragon King was finally going to talk about his true intentions. Over the past month, his performance in the Department of Guards has been given a high appraisal. A lot of people actually think that he is the best man to be the Lord of Jade City. How did Pang Jing react? He was very angry, but he seemed to be even angrier about the Dragon King's disclosure of your real name. He tried to hide it, but it was still very obvious. Everybody was curious about the Dragon King's real name, but he pretended that he didn't care about it at all. He <laughs> he. The day when the registration started, Pan Jing did make a mistake. So he has long since known about my parentage. Zhang Hung nodded. He would rather stay out of the Dragon King's plan for revenge than raise specific objections to it like Fang Wencher did, or encourage him like his killers did. I think so. Pan Jing used to be a fence-sitter for many years, but eventually, he still chose to side with his elder brother and ally with the faction led by the Empress Dowager. This is the only strange thing. The general-in-chief, Pan Jing, and the middle assistant minister, Yang Qin, are supposed to, to be on the same side. However, Pan Jing's recent actions don't seem to be in accord with eunuch Zhong Yu's deeds. Um. Nominally, Zhong Yu is merely an attendant of the envoy of the Central Plains. Now, both the envoy and the vice-envoy are dead, but he is still in the military camp of the Central Plains. After Pan Jing was inaugurated, they have never met each other. It's as if they have been carrying out their own plans. Is Zhong Yu by any chance keeping anything back from the Dragon King? Recalling that cowardly eunuch, Ji Yu Shenwei said, I don't think so. He's merely waiting for further instructions. The conversation seemed to drift further away from the topic of the Lord of Jade City, but Zhang Hung didn't get anxious. Instead, he liked conversations of this exploratory kind of style. Whatever the reason is, Zhong Yu, or Yang Qin, had intentions to co-opt the Dragon King, even if the cost was offending Golden Rock Castle. What is Pan Jing's purpose? Did his acceptance of the unique king's bribe mean that he had ultimately decided to be an enemy of the Dragon King? Pan Jing is our enemy. Ji Yu Shenwei was absolutely certain about this. But he didn't decide to make an enemy of me after taking the bribe. Instead, he made that decision long ago. The Meng family's fortune was merely a symbol that would solidify the relationship between them. Since the Dragon King has never met him before that, there's no doubt that his grudges against you originated from some matters that are related to the last generation. Zhang Heng had naturally come to this conclusion. He began to worry about whether the Dragon King had gone too far. Ji Yushan Wei could tell what the Prime Minister was thinking about, so he said, the Imperial Court of the Central Plains has assigned a task to Pang Jing, which restricts him and also imposes certain rules on Jade City. I'll follow these rules. At least these rules have been more favorable for the Dragon Army so far. Is Pang Jing giving the position of the Lord of Jade City to the unique king? Somewhat urgently, Zhang Hung steered the conversation back to the topic of the Lord of Jade City. I don't think so. First, there is no sign that Prince Xiao is going to lose his power in the Central Plains, which means there probably won't be any major changes to his Western region's strategy anytime soon. 
Second, it seems unnecessary for the unique king to pay such a high price for merely the position of Lord of Jade City. With the Meng family's fortune, he can definitely make much greater profits. He wants the Central Plains to confer a king's title onto him, said Shong Hong. This was a goal that the unique king had always been pursuing, which had been temporarily ignored by many. The Central Plains wants the Dragon King to be the Lord of Jade City and the Unique King to have a king's title. They want the two of you to partition Jade City, each of you ruling half of it or the two of you ruling it together. They want you to be wary of each other at all times, and if any one of you wants to gain an advantage over the other, then you will have to ask the Central Plains for help. This is their plan to build a balance of power. Shong Hung put the letter down. But why doesn't the Central Plains just confer two king's titles? Isn't that much simpler? The letter of the military councillor proved to be very enlightening. Ji Yushenwei had a clearer understanding of many things now. Because I have little connection to the Central Plains. If my title of Dragon King had been acknowledged last year, then I would have been more grateful to the Norland than to the Central Plains. This is why the Central Plains wants to give me the position of Lord of Jade City and make me pay a heavy price during the process of getting it. That way, I'd set great store by this position. One should give the opponent something to dissolve their vigilance in order to take something from them. Light suddenly dawned on Zhong Hong. Who formulated this strategy? Pan Jing? Yang Qin? Or Prince Xiao? Shong Hung thought for a while and then figured out the answer by himself. He was from the Central Plains. Though he had never been a high-rank official there, he was still very familiar with the rules of the bureaucracy. None of them did it. There is no need for anybody to keep the overall situation under control, as this has always been the strategy adopted by the Central Plains. The factions within the imperial court will naturally extend to the Norland and the western regions. In that case, the emperor will be able to influence areas thousands of miles away by merely controlling the people around him. The emperor himself didn't even have to know about this. For him, all of this had been formulated by his ancestors. All he had to do was abide by it. Zhang Hung felt ashamed of himself. He was from the Central Plains, but even a scholar from the Western regions had a clearer understanding of this than he did. So the Dragon King gave up on the position of Lord of Jade City to Long Fanyun because you wanted to tell the Central Plains that the balance of power hadn't been built yet, and that if they wanted to confer a king's title to the unique king, that they would have to acknowledge Dragon King's status as well. This was indeed within Ji Yushenwei's plan, but not all of it. Both the Central Plains and the Western regions have their own respective plans. If I am to share Jade City with another force, then by no means will I choose Golden Rock Castle. The Dragon King was still an Avenger. Shang Hung cautiously steered the conversation away from this topic by saying, then the Dragon King will have to support another competitor. The Waning Moon Hall. I'm afraid that they're not very trustworthy. No matter how ambitious Lotus was, the Waning Moon Hall was currently a weak force. Besides, Ji Yushenwei would never rule hand in hand with her. Lotus was no less threatening than the unique king. What do you think of the Shule Kingdom? asked Ji Yushenwei. M. Territory wise and population wise, the Shule Kingdom is strong enough. However, the prince of the Shule Kingdom, I don't think that he's suitable for this. Prime Minister misunderstood. I meant your personal opinion. What do you think of the Shule Kingdom? Shang Hung instantly understood, and his eyes went wide with shock. Suddenly, he knelt down on his knees. Dragon King. I don't think that I'm competent enough to do it. It's been a long time since the establishment of the Shule Kingdom and the royal family's foundation is very solid. Compared to Jade City, the Shule Kingdom is too large. Like the Central Plains, I also want to partition this country and appoint another ruler for it. The royal family will have part of it. Do you think you can rule the rest of it, Prime Minister? 
According to his Central Plains habits, Zhang Hang should have declined this offer several times. But currently, he was more like a native of the Western regions, so he decided to show his ambition. I won't fail you, Dragon King. Ji Yu Shenwei signaled the Prime Minister to stand up. Go to the military camp of the Shule Kingdom in the West tomorrow, take command of that army, and get to know the generals of the Shule Kingdom. Once you think the time is ripe, bring some men to the Shule Kingdom. The general of the right, Shong Liao, should have recruited another batch of soldiers by now. Snatch command of them and you'll become another king of the Shule Kingdom. Zhang Heng knew that he himself had earned this opportunity. In order to realize his ambition, he had worked hard, but it was worth it. The reward that the Dragon King had given him was beyond his expectation. But. Chapter 968, Little Baldy. Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations. Sabersman Gao Yang had become a newly emerged celebrity in Jade City. He had killed a bounty hunter and caused a series of sensations that had ultimately led to the decline of the Meng family. But surprisingly, he had survived, and he hadn't even been punished, which counted as a miracle, like an aftershock after a great earthquake. Both the Dragon King and the Unique King felt that I was somebody, so they interceded with the governor of the western regions as well as the governor of this city, which is how I was granted a pardon. Standing beside a table, Jiao Yang was once again talking about his experience of escaping from punishment. He was very glad that people were willing to listen to him, and that other sabersmen regarded his words as dishes that went with wine. Yesterday, you said that nobody was watching you, and that you walked out of there yourself. And now you're telling us that you got a pardon? Tomorrow maybe mighty sabersman Jiao will tell us that he fought his way out of northern Jade City. All the people burst into laughter. Surprised that somebody actually remembered what he had said yesterday, Jiao Young also laughed. But soon, he detected an unfriendliness in those laughs and hurled his bowl to the ground, a ferocious look on his face. Are you two kiddos courting death? Come here. Let me slash your necks. Then you'll know whether I was telling the truth or not. A sabersman shut up and shook his head with a smile, indicating that he disdained stooping to his level. Under the influence of alcohol, another sabersman staggered to his feet. Neither you nor Wu Xian accepted the ban on killing. That was why you got away with it unpunished. I accepted it and I'm under the protection of the Department of Guards. You're courting death if you try to kill me. Jiao Yang blushed scarlet his muscles stiff. His eyes were like those of wolves, the sclera much bigger than the pupil. You deserve this. After saying this, he whipped out his long saber. He knew that what that man said was true, but he just couldn't swallow this humiliation. Scared, the sabersman who provoked Jiao Yang partially sobered up, sat down slowly, and murmured, I was just saying. The other drinkers were very used to this kind of scene. It took them only a fleeting thought to decide whether they would try to persuade the interested parties to let it go or try to add fuel to the flames of their rage. On this night, they were not in the mood for bloodshed. So, somebody immediately stood up, gripped Jiao Yang, and pressed him down to the chair, and said only one word to persuade him. Drink. Drink. Jiao Yang grabbed a bowl of wine the owner of which was unknown and gulped it down. God damn it. Now that killing is banned, drinking is the only thing that we can do. If someday drinking is also banned, then there will be no reason for us to stay in Jade City. The hot liquid warmed his body up and with that, a lot of sentimental thoughts flooded into Jiao Yang's mind, but he was unable to express them in words. So instead, he just sank the saber into the surface of the table, which startled other people. Then he yelled, Guys, please get the word out for me. Now that the killers in Golden Rock Castle no longer take orders, I'll be their successor. Whoever wants to kill people is welcome to contact me. The price is fair, and I'll do it quick and clean. 
Whoever introduces a customer to me will get 20% of the payment. The previous rate was 50%. The previous rate was the previous rate. The current rate is the current rate. Besides, I'm not the only one in this business. Can't you see that I've got a helper here? He'll take a share as well. The helper had been quietly sitting beside Gio Young all along. He was wearing a short, sabersman-style jacket but also wearing a handkerchief usually seen on street vendors around his head, and there was no weapons fastened to his belt, which made him bear no resemblance to other drinkers. When drinking, he was very cautious, staring at the wine for quite a while before taking a sip of it, as if it contained lethal poison. Upon hearing Jio Yang mention his name, the helper shivered and hurriedly said, I don't kill people. If you want to be my follower, then you'll have to kill. Full of pride and enthusiasm, Jio Yang grabbed his helper's arm and dragged him to his feet from the seat. How are we supposed to make money if we don't kill? Who will give us wine if we don't have money? And why would we stay here if we don't have wine to drink? Though arbitrary killing had been banned, Jio Yang's remarks still received a lot of approving responses. The helper felt that he should observe the customs of the place, so he also let out a couple of yells. Unexpectedly, their first customer appeared soon after. An old man sitting near the doorway, who seemed to have been listening. Little Baldy. Jio Yang called out again, stood on the spot, and pricked his ears. However, all that he heard was his own breathing. Little Baldy had been fully conscious this whole time. It was just that his acupoint had been struck, and he could neither move nor speak. He only knew that somebody was carrying him on their shoulder and rushing forward, and he lost his sense of direction after a short while. Then somebody came to that person's aid. Little Baldy was blindfolded. This time, he couldn't see anything. After a quiet journey of some length, it suddenly became noisy, as if they had returned to the center of southern Jade City. The saccharine calls made his heart flutter. The noises subsided. Little Baldy was tossed onto the ground and with that, the strip of cloth was removed, and his acupoint restored. He regained his mobility but didn't dare to move. Lying on the ground, he watched the old man who took him here, flurried. The old man was in his fifties, grey-haired, and with a sepulchral face. However, he was very agile and his movement didn't seem like that of an old man at all. What's your name? Sh Shichinjue. Who are you? I'll give you a chance to take a guess. You're a subordinate of the Dragon King or the Unique King. Humph. Of course I am. Guess again. You're. You're the Dragon King's subordinate. This was more Shichinjue's hope rather than his speculation. The old man stared at him for a while. Just take me as the Dragon King's subordinate. I heard that you have something to sell. Take it out and name your price. I can make a deal with you. Shichinjue's heart lurched. He knew that he had made the wrong guess. I don't have it on me. And first, we need to bargain. Then you'll give me the front money. And then I'll bring that thing here and collect the rest of the payment. Verbose, the old man reprimanded and drew a dagger. Then I'll name a price, trade your petty life for that thing. Shichinjue had prepared himself for threat, but he still felt a cold shiver of fear. He stretched out his right arm and said in a quivering voice, then just kill me. There's no way that I'm going to just give that thing to you. The old man sneered. Little monk, it's not that easy to resume a secular life, and it's even more difficult for you to die. The old man gently removed Shichinjue's handkerchief, revealing his bald head. Then, he pressed the dagger against his scalp and moved it back and forth. You have an hour to think about my offer. I'll draw something on the top of your head while you're thinking. Shichinjue's eyeballs moved right and left with the dagger, his body remaining still. He had some kung fu, but it was useless under these circumstances. Wait. 
um. This is what an obedient donkey should do. It'll save both of us some time. The old man straightened himself but didn't put the dagger away. Shichinjui adjusted his clothes, sat down cross-legged on the ground, put his palms together, and started reciting scriptures in a low voice. He had only one thing that could be traded for money, so he wouldn't hand it over for no good reason. The old man widened his eyes with anger and raised his dagger again. Jade City has never been short of braggarts. This monk is probably one of them. There's no need to waste an hour. I just have to cut off his monk's ears. I'd like to see whether he will tell the truth or not after that. Suddenly the old man sensed danger behind him, and with that, he went stiff. Behave yourself. A voice came from behind him. It's pretty late. You should go to sleep now. The old man obediently slumped to the ground and really fell asleep. Shichinjua stopped reciting scriptures and looked at the dwarfish old man who had suddenly shown up in surprise. I know you. You're the Dragon King's subordinate. Alas. Am I really so obscure? Nobody knows who I am without mentioning the Dragon King. Old Man Mu. Your old man Mu, Shichinjua yelled. This was really a catchy name. Old Man Mu smiled. Now we're talking. Shichinjue, your real name is Shijueqing, right? Shichinjue blushed and nodded. He he. The monks of the Four Noble Truths Temple never cease to surprise me. Now that you've recognized me, tell me the truth. How much will the Dragon King pay me? A wickedly meaningful smile appeared on Old Man Mu's face. Enough for you to sleep with all the prostitutes from the south end of Retention Alley to the north end, as long as you can endure it. His thoughts were instantly seen through. Shichinjua blushed scarlet, but he was indeed willing to make this deal. I have a role with the names of all the living monks of the Four Noble Truths Temple in it. All of their names before they became monks as well as their parentage are also in it. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. What uses does it have? Old Man Mu frowned and said. I thought that you would have a Kung Fu manual or something. I. Chapter 969, A Roll. Translator, Hen Yi Translations Editor, Hen Yi Translations. Juetching had become a Buddhist monk when he was eight. At the age of twenty-seven, swayed by a couple of his benefactor's words, he resolutely chose to secularize himself. But as an orphan, both parents of whom had died, he had no relatives that he could go to after leaving the Four Noble Truths Temple. Though his master Shifu gave him several tales of silver, it was not even enough to pay for accommodation in an inn. Having been a receptionist monk for many years, he had a decently wide knowledge about the ways of people, especially about the importance of money. So before he told his master Shafu his decision, he had done some careful thinking about his future life. First, he needed a new name, and the three Chinese characters Shichinjue had instantly popped into his mind. Then, he needed money or something that could be traded for money. He had pondered over this issue for a full day, and the steward monk had scolded him because of this, which had given him another reason to choose secularization. Eventually, he had come up with an idea. That was a month ago. He had heard that someone wanted to buy information about the family backgrounds of eminent monks of the Four Noble Truths Temple. The one who had told him had even joked, even if that guy only offers ten tales of silver for one Buddhist monk, then since there are so many monks in the Four Noble Truths Temple, the total price would be huge, right? And just like that, Shichinjua left the temple that he had been familiar with since childhood and walked to Southern Jade City, thinking that things would be very simple. However, it turned out that he couldn't get in touch with the Dragon King or the Unique King, and that rumored mysterious buyer who was collecting intelligence on Buddhism monks was also nowhere to be found. Less than one day after he left the temple, Shichinjua began to feel afraid, but there was no way back for him now. 
it was impossible for him to return to the Four Noble Truths Temple. He had no professional skills, and he didn't dare kill people. Uproarious nights in southern Jade City was heavenly in other people's description, but after experiencing it himself, he found that it was nothing but a mixture of noises and chaos. The roads were muddy, and the pedestrians were callous. It was no place for a secularized Buddhist monk at all. As luck would have it, he had encountered Sabersman G.A.O. Young. G.A.O. Young was bragging about how he had obtained the respect of both the Dragon King and the Unique King. All of his listeners regarded it as a joke, but Shi Jue, who had happened to pass by and hear it by accident, had taken his word seriously. He had walked up to Jio Yang, respectfully cupped his hands before his chest, bowed, and then asked, You know those two people? Jio Yang had glanced at him briefly before deciding that he would take in this young Buddhist monk and have him serve as his helper and attendant. Shi Qingjue had claimed that he had a treasure of the Four Noble Truths temple to sell. In fact, Jio Yang hadn't really been listening to him and just continued describing how tough he was and what a good place Southern Jade City was. This was merely a petty occurrence that happened in a tavern, but Xu Xiaoyi's informer had overheard their conversation, put it down in an intelligence report, and submitted it to his superior. If it weren't for Jio Yang's nonsense in the report, then Xu Xiaoyi wouldn't have even regarded it as an intelligence report worth reading. The task of collecting information about the Buddhist monks had been progressing so slowly that he had almost forgotten about it. Shang Hung's attention was on the Kung Fu competition that concerned the election of the Lord of Jade City, so he had merely browsed through it and then ignored it. But Ji Yu Shenwei's interest in the Four Noble Truths Temple had never diminished, so he had decided to meet this Shi Jue who claimed to have a role with all of the monks' names on it. Old Man Mu finished the job with ease. The old man whose acupoint had been struck by him was a common sabersman of the Heavenly Mountain sect. Apparently, the secularized Buddhist monk hadn't caught the attention of Zhong Ji or the unique king yet. Old Man Mu pointed at Shi Jue and then said to the Dragon King, This is a talent who just defeated two old prostitutes in southern Jade City. If we send him to the Waning Moon Hall, he will defeat them all without using a weapon in less than a month. With a red face, Shi Qingjue nervously moved his feet but still felt indescribably satisfied. Ji Yu Shenwei hadn't told old man Mu to take him to a brothel, but it seemed to have worked very well. Currently, Shi Qingjue gave him a feeling that he was excited and mild, which meant that he was in a very good mood to socialize with others. I've seen you before, said Ji Yu Shenwei. Yes. The dragon kin. A slightly complacent look appeared on Shi Qingjue's face. His kung fu was just average, and he wasn't a brilliant talk either, but he had a very good memory. Our temple. The Four Noble Truths Temple has 1,326 Buddhist monks. 126 of them are there for a short stay. There are more than 6,000 recorded eminent monks, but only 284 are still alive. Does the Dragon King want information on all of them or just the living ones? It had been many years since the establishment of the Four Noble Truths Temple. There were many eminent monks whose identities were special. The succession of teachings from masters to disciples were all recorded in the role that started from the Buddha himself to monks currently living in the temple, spanning over a time period of thousand years. Of course Ji Yu Shenwei wasn't interested in all of them. After being informed of this, he had requested Shi Qingjue to write down the information about those who were still alive. There were 284 monks. The numbers of words about their biographical sketches varied from a hundred to over a thousand. It would be an arduous task to write down all of them. Ji Yu Shenwei went to handle some miscellaneous official business, but old man Mu stayed behind. It was not because he wanted to supervise the Buddhist monk, but rather because he wanted to find out whether this monk's memory was really as good as he claimed it to be. Shi Qingjue wrote out one page after another, and old man Mu read every one of them. Suddenly, he pulled a page out of the roll and asked the monk what was on it. 
Shi Qingjue immediately recited the contents without a single mistake. Even if this role was false, old man Mu would have still admired this monk for his good memory. If it were an advanced kung fu manual, then he could memoize it after some hard work as well. But it was just a role, the contents of which were very boring. Many narratives were very similar to one another. Upon reading those words, he gradually became sleepy, but the Buddhist monk kept writing quickly and smoothly in high spirits. Ji Yushenwei had scarcely walked out of the room when Red Butt walked towards him head on, a faint concerned look on her face. Dragon King, someone has requested an audience with you. Red Bat's duty was to take care of Long Fanyun and help him handle the official business in the Department of Guards. She seldom directly informed the Dragon King of the arrival of visitors. Who is it? You'll find out when you see her. She asked me not to tell you. There was a distinct hostility and scorn in Red Bat's voice, from which Ji Yushenwei guessed the identity of the visitor. Luo Ningcha was walking around in the room and inspecting things as if the place would soon be her new home. It's so difficult to have an audience with you. Your handmaid kept asking me all kinds of questions. You must be pampering her. Red Bat's face went cold. Ji Yu Shenwei said, she's not a handmaid. Then she must be a slave girl that you brought here from the Norland. You always take in eccentric people. There's already a demonic, green-eyed little girl here. And now you have this dash. Before Luo Ningcha could think of disparaging words to describe the slave girl with barbarian features, Red Bat coldly said, I'll give you some privacy. Then she turned around and left. See? She's so impolite. Dragon King, you should teach her a lesson. What can I do for you? Ji Yu Shenwei asked. Luo Ningcha frowned and cast a glance at the teenager behind the Dragon King. Get out. I want to talk with the Dragon King alone. Qin Yeming already had a vague idea of the Dragon King's habits, so he didn't move, and instead waited for the Dragon King's order. Just ignore his existence, Ji Yu Shenwei said, as if he had no intentions of talking with Luo Ningcha alone. Luo Ningcha peered at the teenager, puzzled. Is he mute and deaf? I think that I used to have a handmaid who was also mute and deaf, and she did a pretty good job. I should get another one. She nodded, thinking of some handmaid who was going to have a misfortune. There are several reasons why I came downtown this time. First, I'm tired of living in a tent. Haven't you lived in a tent since your childhood? Ji Yu Shenwei couldn't help remind this woman of this fact. As a daughter of the ringleader of some bandits, she had had no fixed abode and had lived in a tent before getting married. Luo Ningcha was stunned. After quite a while, she miraculously came up with a remark to contradict him. You used to be a slave. Are you still a slave after you became the Dragon King? I've lived in a tent since childhood, so naturally, I took a dislike to tents after I lived in more comfortable houses. There were no loopholes in Luo Ningcha's words. Ji Yu Shenwei could only say, go on. Why did you come downtown? A smug smile appeared on Luo Ningcha's face. He he. It turns out that sometimes, I can out-argue you. First of all, I'm tired of tents. I want to buy a house I. Chapter 970, A Favor Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations Old Man Mu had taken Shichinjua to a brothel, which had attracted some people's attention. It was with this clue that the monk named Lian Qing had managed to track them down to the Department of Guards. Lian Qing was willing to give up avenging his elder brother's murder, but his impression of the Dragon King was quite poor. A vigilant look appeared on his face the moment he stepped into the Department of Guards. Long Fanyun recognized Lian Qing, and said, Hello, monk. Um, Lian Qing replied in a gruff voice. His eyes swept around the department and then rested on Long Fanyun. You still haven't recovered from the injury in your legs? 
they're incurable. Even Dr. Sun can't heal them. Lian Qing didn't really care about Long Fanyin's injury. He moved his eyes onto Red Bat. Aren't you? Instructor Shangguan's deputy. Why are you in the Dragon King's place instead of the Kuan Society? That doesn't concern you, monk. You're not here to pry into anyone's domestic business, are you? Upon hearing the words domestic business, Long Fanyun felt both warm and embarrassed, so he let out a light cough. Lian Qing scratched his bald head and suddenly understood. Oh, I see. You're right. That's not why I'm here. Please ask the Dragon King to come out. I want an audience with him. Long Fanyun is the one who calls the shots in the Department of Guards. Whatever it is you want to talk with the Dragon King about, you can talk to him about, said Red Bat. Lian Qing pondered it over for a while and then said to Long Fanyun, Old Man Mu took away a monk from the Four Noble Truths Temple. Please hand him over. Long Fanyun only knew that Old Man Mu brought a stranger back. Because that person had been directly sent to the Dragon King, he hadn't asked about the details. At this moment, he didn't know how to answer Lian Qing. Red Bat spoke again. That's weird. Old Man Mu never left Jade City. When did he go to the Four Noble Truths Temple? Ah, Old Man Mu didn't go there. Juechen came to Jade City of his own accord. Last night, someone saw him and Old Man Mu go to Gold Nest Alley. They returned to the Department of Guards this morning. Gold Nest Alley was a place in southern Jade City where cheap brothels were densely located. Red Bat had never heard of this place before, but judging from the amused look in the guards' eyes and their smile, she knew that it was not a good place. So, she snorted lightly and said, so Juecheng went with old man Mu of his own will. Too embarrassed to answer the question, Lian Qing became angry. Long Fan Yun, who's the head of the Department of Guards? You're this woman? What did you just say? Red Bat asked in a severe voice. It was my fault. Amitapa. Please pardon me, female benefactor. Lian Qing bowed and apologized sincerely. Red Bat couldn't take any further action. Having generally understood the situation, Long Fan Yun said, that Jue Qing is a secularized monk, right? He is. It's been less than three days since he was secularized. It doesn't matter how many days it has been. The key is that he no longer has nothing to do with the Four Noble Truths Temple now, since he has been secularized. So why are you here, asking me to hand him over? Lian Qing became somewhat anxious. Jue Qing was indeed secularized, but he took something away from the Four Noble Truths Temple. I'm here to try to persuade him to turn back from his wrong path and back be a monk again. He has even been to Gold Nest Alley. The Four Noble Truths Temple still wants him to be a monk again, asked Long Fan Yun. All of the ten plus guards laughed, but upon seeing the serious look on Red Bat's face, they hurriedly stopped laughing. Lian Qing was running out of patience. No matter what, please ask Jue Qing to come here. I want to have a word with him. Whether he goes with me or not will be left to his own discretion. The Department of Guards won't force him to stay, right? Having no idea what the Dragon King's plan was, Long Fanyun didn't dare give any reckless answers. He was wondering whether he should inform the Dragon King or not when Old Man Mu's voice came from outside. So it turns out that this matter is so simple. He's right here. You can ask him right now. Shi Qingjue followed Old Man Mu into the department's main area, trying to avoid being seen, as if he were afraid of being punished for something bad he had done. When he saw Lian Qing, he put his palms together and said, Marshal Uncle Lian Qing. In fact, Lian Qing had become a Buddhist monk much later than Shi Qingjue. It was just that he happened to be indentured to an eminent monk, so his status was higher than that of Shi Qingjue. When he saw Jue Qing dressed in secular clothes, he involuntarily furrowed his forehead. 
Juetching, why are you dressed like this? I. Marshal Uncle, my new name is Shiching Jue. I've already been secularized. Lian Qing knew that they would only end up arguing over meaningless details if he contradicted him, so he ignored old man Mu and instead addressed Shiching Jue who was behind him. Juetching, you must think twice. A single slip can cause a long-lasting sorrow. Even if you hold no gratitude to the Four Noble Truths Temple for its kindnesses, do you not care about your master Shifu's reputation either? If the information in that role is divulged, then your master Shifu will be held responsible. Sha Qingjue's face fell ashen. Old Man Mu consoled him. Don't worry. We'll get your master Shifu out of the temple as well, and he'll also become secularized. You've just taken a glimpse of this pleasurably and material world and you haven't had your first taste of the real fun yet. The Dragon King and I will make sure that you and your master Shifu will never want to be Buddhist monks again. My master Shifu won't resume a secular life. Unlike me, he's an eminent monk. Your master Shifu holds no grudges against you. Lian Qing decided to strike while the iron was hot. In a mild voice, he continued to try to persuade him. The monks of the Four Noble Truths Temple come from various countries. They left their homeland because they wanted to sever their connections with the secular world. If that role falls into the wrong hands, then do you know how dire the consequences will be? What do you mean by the wrong hands? Old Man Mu became angry. Do you by any chance think you've converted yourself from a bandit to a good person just because you shaved clearly? I swore an oath that I would never kill again. Do you think that this change is enough? I was reborn. Nobody managed to do something like this before, and nobody will ever be able to do it ever again. Do you think that I'm still a villain? Monk. Old man Mu kept nagging self-indulgently. Lian Qing ignored him and just stared at Shi Qingjue, hoping that he would recover from the brink of the precipice. Shi Qingjue lowered his head and weighed his decisions, the color of his face alternating between normal and red. Suddenly, as if having made up his mind, he raised his head and said, Marshal Uncle Lian Qing, please go back to the temple and tell my master Shifu this, Jue Qing is steeped in sin, and I'm beyond redemption in this incarnation. However, I won't bring him any trouble. The role is in my memory, and I'll try to forget it as soon as possible and never tell anybody anything about it. Good. Lian Qing was relieved. Old man Mu watched Shi Qingjue in puzzlement, thinking, if he is lying, then this lie is perfect, which proves that this young monk is a man of great potential. But if he is telling the truth. But Shi Qingjue's face hadn't returned to normal yet. But I've already written half of it down and given it to, the Dragon King. Taken aback, Lian Qing abruptly turned around and yelled aloud, Dra Dash. The Dragon King was standing right at the gate, as if he had been listening for quite a long time. Beside him stood a teenage servant. Lian Qing choked down the rest of his sentence, let out two coughs, and said, Dragon King, please give me the role that was written by Jue Qing. That thing is of no use to you. The Four Noble Truths Temple is not your enemy. Does the Four Noble Truths Temple have any enemies? No. Buddhist monks stand aloof from the secular world. How could we possibly have any enemies? Then why are you afraid of the information in the role being divulged? In this world, there are always, Lian Qing stopped himself in time. He knew that he wouldn't be able to win this argument with the Dragon King. Dragon King, Instructor Shangguan has been laboring away for you, and Marshal Uncle Fa Cheng has already agreed to expel the evil internal energy in you. Do I detect a note of threat? asked Old Man Mu. Lian Qing put his palms together and bowed. No matter what, Marshal Uncle Fa Cheng will keep his promise, and there are no strings attached. As for the role, the decision is at the Dragon King's discretion. After saying this, surprisingly, Lian Qing closed his eyes and started reciting a sutra in a low voice in the hall of the Department of Guards. 
Involuntarily, Shi Qingjue followed suit. Old Man Mu punched Shi Qingjue's abdomen, who instantly let out a pained cry and recalled that he was no longer a Buddhist monk. After waiting for a while, Ji Yu Shenwei said to Shi Qingjue, Go and bring the roll here. Shi Qingjue gratefully nodded and hurriedly ran out of the hall. In a muted voice, Old Man Mu said, I went through a lot of trouble and finally managed to snatch him from Golden Rock Castle. It won't be wasted just like this, right? Old Man Mu was exaggerating the difficulty of the task. Ji Yu Shenwei ignored him. Shi Qingjue ran back into the hall with a stack of paper, dithering over to whom he should give it to. Take it. All the pages are here, said Ji Yu Shenwei. Lian Qing opened his eyes, showing a very Sioux. Chapter 971 Exploitation. Translator, Hen Yi Translations Editor, Hen Yi Translations. Luo Ningchao was still waiting for her reward, and feeling very displeased that the Dragon Kings had left midway through the meeting. Alone in the guest room, she lost her temper and broke everything that she could in the room. Admittedly, it wasn't much as the Department of Guards was a poor institution. The Han made little shin, this Chinese name means carefulness, as her name suggested, was standing carefully at the doorway. She tried her best to contract her body and minimize it, praying that the mistress wouldn't notice her. From time to time, though, she had to kneel down and sweep the shattered pieces aside lest the mistress step on them and hurt herself. Don't underestimate me, Luo Ningcha mumbled as she paced up and down. She didn't notice the handmaid who was busy cleaning the floor beneath her feet. Don't underestimate me, she repeated. And with that, the dragon king came inside again. I know what you and Prince Xiao did better than anyone. If this goes public, then everybody will suffer, Luo Ningcha yelled upon seeing him, the anger continuing to well up inside her. What Prince Yao and I did? Inevitably, there was a trace of sarcasm in Ji Yu Shenwei's tone. Luo Ningcha's face flushed red, which was a rare scene, but it soon returned to normal. We all resorted to unscrupulous tactics. If either of us laugh at the other, then it would be like the pot calling the kettle black. Didn't you ransack your brains trying to think of ways to fawn on the tenth young master? If she had said servant Huan, fuck me, then would you have refused? That's your foe's daughter? No. You did sleep with someone not with her but with. Get out. She had said the last two words to the handmaid. Little Shin, who had been waiting for this order this entire time, turned around and slipped through the narrow gap between the door and the door frame as agilely as a rat being chased by a cat. The Dragon King had no attendance with him this time, so Luo Ningcha's anger slightly subsided. Her exhaustion setting in, she sat down into a chair and said in the sincerest tone she could put on, everything I did, I did it for, us and Chenga. Why are you jealous? You have your tactics and I have mine. Only by cooperating can we be invincible. Aren't you the very reason why I ended up like this? If I gained Prince Xiao's favor, then it would only do you good. It won't do you any harm. Don't you think so? So you should thank me. This petty position of Lord of Jade City is nothing to you. Why not give it to Chenga? Don't you want him to inherit the title from the unique king? Ji Yu Shenwei knew this woman well, so he didn't want to argue with her. It was impossible for her to understand the fact that there were still some sane men who didn't like her in this world, much less the fact that she was not the only one who cared about their personal interests. They're not contradictory desires. I've done some thinking. In fact, the unique king is just a fancy title, the territory attached to which is merely Golden Rock Castle. The Lord of Jade City sounds inferior, but the one who bears this title will own the entirety of Jade City. I want them both, both to be given to Chenga. He needs both a noble title and a vast territory. The way the Dragon King was looking at her was a little strange. He hasn't given me this kind of gaze for a long time. 
Luo Ningcha was both a little nervous and a little delighted, but she affected an air of annoyance out of force of habit. What kind of dirty thoughts are you having right now? Can men think of anything decent? Ji Yu Shenwei's thoughts bore no resemblance to what Luo Ningcha believed he was thinking about. My real name is Ji Yu Shenwei. Haven't you ever been surprised by this? Luo Ningcha was stunned. Why should I? Maybe you'll find yourself a new name in a day or two. No matter what, in my eyes, you'll always be the Dragon King, the one who used to be called Servant Huan, the one who is my son's father. Following his own train of thought, Ji Yu Shenwei continued to speak. My father's name was Ji Yu Lan. He used to be a general in the Central Plains. After he retired, he took all of my family members to the western regions, but killers of Golden Rock Castle massacred them all. I alone survived through sheer luck. Then the big head god bought me, which was why I entered Golden Rock Castle with you. Actually, these facts could have been deduced long ago, but Luo Ningcha had never bothered to think about it. After hearing his words, she seemed to have suddenly understood. Oh. It was Shengguan and you who killed all your family members, right? And he lost a palm for that. So it turns out that you were the reason why I was married to a disabled man. Anger surged through her as she recalled the past. She tried very hard and finally managed to subdue it. By the way, where's Shengguan and you? I saw him on. Feeling that she had understood something, Luo Ningcha pondered over several possibilities, but couldn't narrow them down no matter how hard she tried. Can you please not break off in the middle of your remark? Pan Jing wants to bribe you, so just sell some information to him. Luo Ningcha thought for another while. So it is him that you're suspecting? Um. Let me think. Let me think. She glared at him and said angrily. You're such a jerk. You've tricked me again. Why are we talking about your business? What about Chenga? Do you not care about him at all? Don't worry. The registration of candidacy for the post of the Lord of Jade City is over, and nobody can change the list. But that Central Plains guy still has the power to decide whether the unique king's title is an officially acknowledged king's title. I know this. Prince Xiao promised me that. Are you saying that we should also have Pan Jing make a promise? Um. This does sound unnecessary. The situation in the Central Plains is too complicated. We can never have too many allies. But isn't Pan Jing your foe? That's just my speculation. Besides, I can still take advantage of him even if he's indeed my foe. A delighted smile appeared on Luo Ningcha's face. Dragon King, this is exactly what I like about you, no matter what, you always take advantage of your enemies before you kill them. Um. I have a lot to learn from you. If you have some other tactics, you have to teach them to me. It was very easy to take advantage of Luo Ningcha, but it was also very risky. Nobody could impose any restraints on her, since even if she accepted them, she might not be able to abide by them. You can't keep anything back from him if you want him to trust you, so tell Pan Jing whatever he wants to know. Just regard this name, Guansheng, as one of the messages you'll tell him. Tell him everything. You know, I know a lot of secrets, Luo Ningcha said smugly. It's okay. But don't tell him voluntarily. Wait for him to ask you. I understand this much. If I offer up the information voluntarily, then it will be worthless. Um. Upon realizing that there were a lot of other interests that she could trade the information for, Luo Ningcha became somewhat excited. Now even if the Dragon King changed his mind, she wouldn't give up doing this task. But Chenna will surely inherit the king's title, right? Don't trick me into doing all this for nothing. He will. As long as you behave yourself. I'll behave myself. Luo Ningcha put on a timid expression. 
She had learned this from Xu Yang Wei and had been practicing it very often. But this time, the tactic didn't work as well as she had expected it to. Ji Yushan Wei said blandly, from now on, don't try to contact me again. I'll have someone keep in contact with you. You can talk to him if you need anything. Surprisingly, Luo Ningcha didn't raise any objections. In a mysterious tone, she said, I know why you're trusting me with this. Ji Yushan Wei was faintly surprised. Oh? Because Pan Jing doesn't count as a man, and so you have nothing to worry about. After staring at her for a while, Ji Yushan Wei turned around and left. Luo Ningcha believed that her guess was right. Li Xiaozhu. Ji Yushan Wei was still thinking about this name. This person had hit himself very well, so he had to find a way to force this person to show himself. A commotion came from the front yard. Ji Yushan Wei walked there and saw that three guards were fighting a man. That man was tall and strong. Though he was pinned to the ground by three swordsmen of the big snow mountain, he was still struggling, and there were even several occasions where he nearly managed to free himself. Angry, a guard gave him two severe blows to the back of his head and finally quieted him down. Lying prostrate on the ground, Jiao Yang struggled to raise his head and yelled upon seeing the Dragon King, Dragon King, fight a duel with me. There's no honor in winning by sheer weight of numbers. Ji Yushan Wei signaled those guards to let go of him. Like a beast that had just been let loose, Jiao Yang abruptly jumped to his feet and glared at the Dragon King, growing ferocity gleaming in his eyes. A guard said, Dragon King, we caught him. Unconvinced, Jiao Yang yelled, I walked in here on my own account. For what did you walk in here on your own account? I. I came here to look for someone. Where's little Baldy? You kidnapped him and brought him here. Hand him over. Now. Who is him to you? He's my brother. We. We're sworn brothers. Anyways, hand him over to me first. If you don't, then I'll come here again tomorrow. Jiao Yang was not stupid. He uttered some bluster and then turned to leave. A dozen guards blocked his path at the gateway, their hands on the hilts of their swords. Jiao Yang stretched out a little and loudly said, Let's do this by the rules. Take your turns. One at a time. Where's my saber? Give it back to me. Ji Yu Shen Wei.